Don Arnerius, another elder at New <coughs> Covenant, is going to minister this morning. Don? Goodness, there are lights. <laughs> What I'm wanting to talk about uh, this morning, I think, is perhaps the most essential aspect of man. And I want to start by looking in, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 31. A lot of times we are, our quest is to find out who, who am I, and also who am I to be. And I think oftentimes we fall short of that. But out of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, then God, I'm reading out of the NIV. Yep. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And in verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. I think the, the Genesis account is given to us by revelation from God, this is not something that we're able to apprehend by ourselves. But I think we see the playing out of the, one of the prominent elements of who man, and when I say man, I mean man, woman, the created being, is as if we look at Adam and Eve in the garden. And we see in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, now the serpent... In other words, we're seeing, we're, we're going to find here in these early chapters all the prominent players in our lives. And we're going to see an interaction there. We're going to see consequences that arise there. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then we have in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was there with her and he ate it. We see here Eve exercising her will to disobey the living God, the creator God who had created both she and Adam. And it is the will of man that is perhaps the highest gift that God has given to us. God does everything according to his own will. And he had given that will into Adam and Eve. You might say, well, why didn't God intervene here at this time? She knew that she was not to eat of that tree. She had all the information she needed for living properly. And yet she was able, God had given her a will, and she could choose to not eat or she could choose to eat. She certainly chose to eat to the detriment of mankind and humanity. 
but a detriment that God himself knew in advance and had already planned for to bring a salvation. So the woman was deceived. The man just willfully disobeyed, arrogantly disobeyed. And they did become like God in a small measure, knowing good and evil. And God did not want that for man. We find in Romans 12 that when Paul is talking about love, there it says that love abhors evil. Love abhors evil. And it abhors evil because evil takes us away from the things God would give us. The goodness that he would give into us as his children on that. And so we find that here in the garden that God the judge comes forth and brings forth consequences to the exercise of the will of Adam and Eve, the exercise of the serpent who was motivated by a a fallen angel formerly known as Lucifer, the adversary now, Satan. And we see there that the woman had increased pain in childbearing. The ground was cursed uh, for man. The serpent, which was one of the most beautiful of animals in God's creation, was uh, caused to uh, crawl on the dust forever. And there was to be enmity, enmity between the... uh, the uh, children of Adam and Eve and the serpent. And it also mentions in there that in a very light way that the seed of man would strike the the serpent's head and he would strike the, the foot of the man. In Revelation 3.20, uh, Jesus uh, is speaking to the church at Laodicea. And he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Now this is the risen Christ, seated in the heavenlies, knocking at the door. And not, he will not come in unless you or I open that door. Unless we exercise our will to open that door to the sovereign God, he will not come in. I think this again and again is emphasizing the centrality of the will of man, the will of woman in the living of life before the the sovereign God. There's the uh, story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life, to receive the life of of the age that is coming when God enters in and transforms everything? And they dialogue, and Jesus talks about keeping the commandments, and he says, oh, I've, I've done this, this, and, and, uh, and then Jesus spoke to him and said, there's one thing thou lackest. This was the rich young ruler. He said, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. Scripture doesn't really tell us the fate of the rich young ruler. But notice that the rich young ruler left. Jesus did not pursue. Jesus did not try to convince him because he knew that that man knew exactly what was needed. He knew what he needed to do to receive eternal life that the riches were a weight around his foot that would cause him to stumble. But it was the choice of the man 
The rich young ruler had that choice. You and I exercise his choices. And I don't think we appreciate how our life is shaped by the choices we make, those positive, proactive choices, and then the very negative choices of indifference, apathy, being called away in many different ways. I want to look at First uh, John. I'm going to look at Satan and this world age that we're living in. And in First John 5.19, I probably ought to turn around and read it off the... When I surrendered my life to, to Jesus and I was 38 and a half, I said, God, I don't want there to be a devil. I don't like the thought. It's repulsive to me. I don't like that. But that isn't reality. And we need to learn to understand reality. It says in verse 19, We know... We Christians know that we are children of God, born of God, transformed by God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We find in in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus, on the night he's betrayed, refers to Satan as the prince of this world. We see... uh, in Ephesians, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of darkness. Jesus said uh, in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. This Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy from you and me. He would love to kill our relationship to God. He would like to steal the inheritance God wants to give us. He would steal the promises from us by saying, you're not worth anything. Who are you to think God would do that for you? He is our adversary. And the difficulty is that he usually relies on Lies and deception, just like with Eve. And our difficulty is we tend to believe the lies. In Second Corinthians five ten. Paul is, I'm just taking this out, he has much more here. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. All of us, it's not our choice. I can't choose to not come before the judgment seat of Christ. I will appear there. God will bring me to that judgment seat. And I am going to give an account. And uh, we saw, we didn't really see, Adam and Eve, uh, Eve said, you know, the serpent deceived me, and the man said, the woman did me in. You know, everybody passing the buck, not wanting to be responsible. I'll tell you, when you stand before Christ, all those deceptions, all those lies you believe, you know are going to be false. And they're just going to be disappear. And you'll stand there in truth and you'll see things that you would not want to see. The reason I'm doing this, I mean, how many times you, you, you watch the TV show and someone comes up on the street, uh, sir, are you going to heaven? And he says, well, I'm, I hope I am. I, I think I am. You know, I... I I help the neighbor and I do this and that and the other. See, this is our opinion. That we're all somehow good 
irrespective of how we're living our lives. But that's not God's plan. God's plan is much richer for people. So God is, through Christ, is going to judge. And it says in the Bible, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have done that. I can remember when I was hearing that and I said, I I, I didn't think I was a sinner. I I only could remember the good deeds I did. And I didn't know what sin was. But it also says that the wage of sin is death. That's God's declaration. The wage of sin is death. What does that mean? That I just fall down and die a physical death? No, it means a separation from the life of the mighty God, his mighty Savior, and his mighty Holy Spirit. It means separation from the fountain of life. It's separation from the grace of God that he would bestow upon you. If, if you would choose, if you would turn, if you would receive all these things. And uh, Abraham, when he was pleading for uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, will not the judge of all the world do right? And the point is, the judge will do right. And what the judge, if you're in court and you're... You want the judge, what? To declare the guilty to be guilty and the innocent to be innocent. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In in Exodus 33, 17, Moses has pleaded with God earlier, and he says, uh, who's going to go with me when I lead these people up? I don't want to go by myself. And in 14, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And then in 17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And here's a fundamental declaration. I, the sovereign God, will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And this is a a fundamental a fundamental declaration of God's sovereignty. He will be merciful to whom he will be merciful. And if we look uh, in James 4, 6, which is quoting out of Proverbs, oops, (laughs) <laughs> James 4, 6. <laughs> okay. But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor or gives grace to the humble. That's a revelation of God's heart how he assesses things, how he looks at things. God says, I am going to oppose the proud. David Wilkerson, a couple decades ago, had a newsletter in which he, I think, very wonderfully associated pride with independence and humility with dependence. And so what God is saying here, he's going to resist those that will be independent, will do their thing, do what they choose. But he says, I will give grace to the humble, those who will depend upon me. 
And I think this is a very rich dividing line. God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. We all have aspects of pride that sometimes I intend in. God opposes the pride, gives grace to the humble. And then if we look, and I'll just, I've got it written out here in Zephaniah, in the Old Testament, Zephaniah, when it's talking about the Jerusalem that's coming, verse 11 and 12 in chapter 3, on that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from this city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek and the humble who trust in the name of the Lord. This is revealing more and more the character of our, of our God. And we see this and we can say, is there any hope for me? <laughs> the wage of sin is death. Of course, the rest of that is, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But in the book of Jeremiah in chapter 31, verses 33 and God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with the nation of Israel and with people. He had formed on Mount Sinai the old covenant, the basis of which was the giving of the law, which the Jews prized. But here, about 600 B.C., 600 years before the birth of Christ, this prophetic word came through the prophet Jeremiah, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. God relate, wants to relate to people through covenant. Through covenant. And it's a covenant that he defines. We do not come along and say, I want these provisions in this covenant. This is what God has declared. I will put, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. And they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord. Because they will all know me. From the least to the greatest, says the Lord. We're not talking about knowing about. We're talking about knowing. We're, that's, this is the relational knowing. You are going to know, God wants to, his people to know him. We had heard earlier about Father being mentioned, or I guess that was in Sunday school, come to think of it. <laughs> but that God is wanting relationship. He is wanting a family, a family of mankind that he had created in his image, that had fallen from great grace through when sin and death entered in through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. And then uh, later here it says, for I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. How is the judge of all the earth going to be able to forgive our wickedness and not take, bring our sins up before us ever again? How can he do that? And this is where the cross of Jesus Christ came in. God's justice was fully satisfied. The wrath of God was fully satisfied in the death of God's son Jesus upon the cross. Died for our sins. He suffered the death, the separation from God that you and I easily deserved. And when you think about it, it's just, it's just amazing 
There's such love. And if you think about it, Christ, before the foundation of the world, before the creation of man, God determined that his son would come and die for the creation that he was to create. And he also knew that his son was going to come as Jesus, the man. I'm trying to stress how high God's creation of man is. It's so high that his son was going to come into that. And it talks in the Bible about that God, that seated at the right hand of God is the man, Christ Jesus. This, this is, I, I want you to appreciate that God loves you and me and he hungers to have a relationship that he has made available through the covenant that Christ ratified by his death on the cross. This inaugurated this new covenant, a covenant in which God says, I want you to know me, not know about me. And I do want you to depend upon me because I am the life giver. In 1 John 2.2, 2, says, Jesus is the atoning, atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is what God has done. It is God's desire that man choose to re enter into this covenant by receiving Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's God's desire, but it's not his will. His desire, it is a desire so that you and I have choice. I can choose to humble myself Confess my sins, acknowledge my shortcomings, acknowledge my great need. I can choose to do that, or I can choose not to do that. And God will let us let that happen. He resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. I think a lot of times... You talk to people, and I'm not talking about people. And the difficulty is sometimes our thinking, you know. I'm not going to hell. That's the least important part of this great salvation. That's the least. I mean, if, if, if all you're wanting is not to go to hell, you're not wanting to know God, you're not wanting to receive this newness of life that he has, a life that allows you to relate to him more intimately and wonderfully. We all don't appreciate that this great God wants intimacy with you and me here in the living of life. And that we need that life. We need that life. We mentioned it in Sunday school this morning. One of, the, one of the most favorite metaphors that Jesus gave on the night that he was betrayed. In chapter 15 of John, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. What is that picture? Christ himself is showing that I need to be fully dependent upon him for life through that picture of the branch. The branch, once it's separated from the vine, that, that's it. That's it. But we say... I mean, I was raised to, to be independent. You know, become responsible, take charge, do all these things. But the Bible teaches that doesn't lead to life. Dependency on God leads to life. It leads to fullness. It leads to fulfillment of life. And yet, the devil will encourage us to exercise our will in ways that is harmful to us. 
and yet we don't appreciate. The difficulty is when we do certain things, we know it's wrong, but we cannot weigh the consequences of that action. But there is loss. There is loss. Tremendous loss. Much more. Okay, uh, I just put a few things down here. Entering into the new covenant. I need to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Lord means he's in charge. The kingdom of God has a king, and God has made his son to be Lord of that kingdom. If I want to enter into that kingdom, I've got to live by the ways of the kingdom. And I lead to live under the king. That is what I, when I receive Jesus as Savior and Lord, the Savior part gets rid of the, the power, the forgiveness and the, all the cleansing that's needed and the power of sin in my life. But I have to. I have to. I can't submit for my wife. I have to submit. I want to be in the kingdom of God. I want to be under the rule. I want to be the, one of the people of God. I want the righteousness of the kingdom to come forth in me. I want the Holy Spirit to be writing in me the ways of God. I want to know my God more intimately. I have to choose that. I have to humble myself. Surely God will help me, but I have to participate. You know, I, can, I have to confess I'm a sinner. That was hard for me at one time. And I have to receive forgiveness for my sins. I need to be born from above by the Holy Spirit of God. I need to be sure I'm receiving this eternal life that that rich young man was talking about. Follow him. And the eternal life is the life of the kingdom. In John 17, Jesus, again, this is that same last few days of his life. He said, this is eternal life, that you may know the one true God and him who he sent. Know him, not know about him, not to turn to look him up on Google or some Facebook or something like this. We're talking about where you live, where you live. It's so nice. It's so nice. There's such a freedom in God. And I know uh, it's a good thing my eyesight isn't quite as good. That light blinds me, so I really can't see it's 12.02. <laughs> God told Moses, my presence would go with you. The presence of God. So the presence of God isn't the fullness of God. Moses was out in the desert and he, he got noticed a bush that was burning. But it didn't, wasn't consumed. It just continued to burn. And he said, well, I think I'm going to go and investigate that. He could have chosen to say, no, I've got too much busyness to do. That is interesting. But I'm... Um, I'm not going to be concerned with it. But he turned aside. Then, it, then we have Jacob's dream at Bethel. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. That's interesting. God can be in a place, and I cannot be aware of it. That is interesting. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. March 4th, which I think is soon, somewhat soon, <laughs> uh, a little over a week away, marks one year anniversary of God's presence in this sanctuary. That was when some, and I'm, I'm not one with details. I don't, I mean, I am a detail person. I don't remember the details. That's the, what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but there was an aroma, a fragrance noticed in this sanctuary. but there was no source for that fragrance. Moses said, I'm going to turn aside and look at that bush. See what's happening. And God was there in the bush. Spoke through the bush to Moses. You're standing on holy ground. Take your shoes off. I would suggest that that fragrance of God is here. And I think God is wanting you to come and see. Not arrogantly, not to prove anything, but to come as a human being, hopefully to come as a son or daughter, and hopefully to be touched by the living God. His presence transforms. We behold in in a glass darkly the face of God and we are changed from glory to glory. He wants to change you from glory to glory. I know I'm going to have to stop. I love the prophetic words of God. I love the promises in God. When I look and I say, Don, where is your potential? I say, my potential lies in the promises of God. Those have been given for me. But that promise doesn't mean a thing unless I say amen to God. That's why I love to come into the sanctuary. And I say, God, it says in Romans 8.29 that it is your desire and your plan that I be conformed to the image of your son Jesus. God, I want that in my life. I want that. It's not going to happen in a moment. I want you to enter into my life, into my life circumstances, so that I am changed. I want what you want to give. I want to be one who freely receives that I might freely give. I want to see the lost come to life. They've got to humble themselves. They've got to humble themselves. I know at one level this is somewhat, I don't know how to, it's a serious thing. And the reason it's serious is there is a devil who hates you and wants to deprive you of all the good that God would bring your way in any way he can do that. There's that old man, the man of sin, that wants to rise up and exercise things that are of no good. This world is passing away. Don't invest in this world. It is passing away. Let the kingdom of God come into your life. Let the king come in. Let him be Lord, life giver. But it's our choice. Our choice. God loves us. But he loves us so much that he made a way for you and me to be sons and daughters of the Most High who are always knowing our God better and better. I like to pray... And I started this many years ago. I said, God, I believe I've received part of the life you've got for me in your son Jesus. And I thank you for that. But I know there's more. And I know it's your will that I receive more. And so I started praying, God, I want to receive more of the life that is mine in Christ Jesus. I want to receive more of that life. Now, when I say that, I'm giving God access to my life to bring any consequence he wants to, any intrusion, anything, because my desire is to receive more. And in 1 John, in chapter 5, it says, you know, if we ask anything according to his will, we know he hears us 
And if he hears us, we know we have the petition of our heart. I know God wants to give me more. So when I pray that, and if I come in this sanctuary to do that or anywhere, I know that I have what I have prayed for. Does that mean you get it in a moment? No. God is a relational God and desires for relationship. Faith is very important to God. Faith is a relational term. Faith requires that I know God. And the more I know him, the stronger my faith is. The stronger my reliance on, on God is. In the Old Testament, it says, trust in, the, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. Trust in the Lord with your whole heart, with your whole being, all that you are. Faith in God, God wants our faith to grow. It wants, he wants it to be nourished. It's, it's supposed to be alive because it is our response to God, our yielding to him as we, as we live before him. Let me... Uh, the key is your, is your will. Will you yield your life to Christ Jesus? Will you do that again with a fuller heart, a richer heart? Would you allow God to be God in your life? Would you be willing to humble yourself to receive life more abundantly in this time? It's your choice. I'll tell you, if it was mine, I'd choose it for you. But it's not. It's your choice. Let us pray. Father, I just thank you for this great love of yours you've given in Christ. That Christ became the man, Christ Jesus, who is now the God-man. And that you're calling us to life in your Son, in this season and time, a greater life, a fuller life, a richer life, an abounding life, a life with love, a life with caring, a life with mercy, a life that is more interested in the purposes of God and that purpose expressed so wonderfully well that Jesus is our atoning sacrifice, but not only ours, but for everyone in the world. We pray, Father, for your purposes to be realized more and more in our lives as we choose to pursue you, to seek you, to seek your face, seek your ways, seek to be transformed by the love of God and the grace of God, to be children, loved children that are able to serve the living God more wonderfully and fully in this life here in this world. We pray, Father, for your promises to new covenant to be stirred up within us and within us as a church. And I do ask your blessing, Father, to each heart that's here, that you would work in their circumstances to give them opportunities to choose to come nearer to the living God in the greatness of life he has for each of us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.